On your Monday episode of Locked on Raptors, the Raptors signed a couple of guards over the weekend, including Jeff Doughton Jr., which means if they want it to be, the Raptors' guard rotation seems like it's just about complete. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Plus, we get into the big picture question of can Scotty Barnes actually thrive playing point guard? It's all coming up on your Monday episode of Locked on Raptors. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, July the 24th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on Twitter at WoodleySean. You can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free on your favorite podcast apps. And if you're realizing that Twitter is uh, on its last legs once again and is a very bad website, run by a very dumb guy come hang out in a place that is overseen by a guy who yes is kind of dumb but is like a friendly kind of dumb that is of course the lockdown raptors discord we're on the boss baby come hang out link is in the description would love to see you in there it's been a great place to talk raptors we're playing hoop grids which has been a great great time our pal off season just destroying everybody at hoop grids like 95th percentile and above pulls on his uh, rarity scores it's been a delight to see uh just like watching usain bull in the flesh i suppose but in uh, nba trivia form it's it's wonderful come hang out in the discord link is in the description it's a great place you can go and uh, subscribe to the show of course on youtube as well for free hit the big red subscribe button and we very much appreciate your patronage over there okay today's show is brought to you by our friends over at prize picks first time users can receive a 100 percent instant deposit match of 200 bucks with the promo code locked on that's prizepicks.com promo code locked on to play some daily fantasy sports more on them a little later let's get to it now we're talking guards we're talking scotty barnes at point guard and all of the pros and cons that could come with it with our pal vivek jacob of raptors.com who is here today on a monday big v how the hell are you i'm good man good uh it's been a good weekend relaxed um saw you on the thursday yeah man. and uh, that was a uh, an early kickstart to the weekend so that was fun <laughs> um and now back at it talking raptors back at it talking raptors uh as we continue to uh bring you the daily talk that uh you know some people really you know when they realize oh there's not much going on this time of year we're gonna scale back our posting schedule not us baby we're going to keep on rolling because uh, what else is there to talk about? There's nothing else to do. Just, the world's horrible. Uh, we're going to talk about basketball and take our minds off of it. Okay, uh, let's dive in to the guard situation, shall we? Over the weekend, Javon Freeman Liberty, the uh, star for the Chicago Bulls in Summer League, signed to a two way deal with the Raptors, along with Ron Harper Jr., rounding out the two way pool alongside Marquise Noel. And then Jeff Dout- Doughton signed to a camp contract. Uh, it'll be a guaranteed deal if he makes the team. Uh, you know, we've seen this kind of thing before with guys it's pretty standard and I would assume he's going to get a pretty good look at making this roster considering what he did last year for the 905 and a little bit of action with the Raptors uh you combine that with Gary Trent Jr. having opted in you've got Dennis Schroeder signed with the mid-level and of course Scotty Barnes who I kind of view as a wing, but clearly the team seems to view him more as a lead guard type. Darko Ryakovic has talked all season long or off season long about getting the ball in his hands and having him do more. And I think that's a good thing in some ways and potentially damaging to the team in other ways. We'll get into that as we go along through this show. But Big V, obviously more deals can happen. It seems like the Pascal thing has kind of cooled off for the moment and uh, maybe just nothing's going to go down there. And so there's a chance that the roster is now set barring any other moves, if that is in fact the guard rotation, when you factor in as well Malachi Flynn, um, and I guess, you know, some other back-end roster options who I'm forgetting. No, the team is like 90% forwards. I think I've named all the guards. Uh, (laughs) Where are you at right now with that guard rotation? Is that a guard rotation that can compete in the Eastern Conference, uh, or are they going to be in tough for guard play after losing Fred Van Vliet for nothing? Yeah, I would be pretty disappointed if this was the guard rotation entering the season i still think you know even if it's not pascal between that log jam of precious and boucher and mm-hmm. that and you know I, I think there's still uh an opportunity there to uh, level up the the depth that guard a, a little bit and so um 
right now, uh, I don't think this would be ideal. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, in terms of competing in the Eastern Conference, I, I think it's going to be tough. I think the Raptors uh, are, again, probably uh, to start the season, we'll, we'll be looking at that play-in uh, situation and, and thinking if they can get into that and get in the mix for that. Mm-hmm. And we'll see if there's bigger deals to be made then you know you you're all in on the development and it's about wins and lessons baby <laughs> yeah there'll be a lot of lessons uh, i i think yeah look i've made no uh i made this pretty clear i think i think the guard rotation situation is kind of a mess and not replicating any of the stuff you lost with Fred Van Vliet, which if you just boil it down to numbers, it's 14 drives a game. It's four and a half pull-up threes a game. It's nine threes combined a game. Whether or not he hit them accurately last season or not, teams guarded him as though he was a three-point threat. And as a pull-up guy, he was actually pretty good as a pull-up guy, 34% on four and a half attempts. That is good. That is defense shifting because defenses have to worry about it. I'm pretty concerned about the lack of guard play and creation on this roster right now, and they're going to have to get real creative with how they go and create stuff in the half court. We'll get into it in a second here about how you know we think Scotty Barnes might fare as that lead guard, but is it safe to assume that right now they're probably going into the year with Scotty as the penciled-in starter at point guard? I know Dennis Schroeder's there. I know Dennis Schroeder probably fancies himself as a starter type, just considering how Dennis Schroeder seems to feel about Dennis Schroeder, which is a good thing, by the way. I think that's bad, um, but that's just Dennis Schroeder. Uh, do you think... Like, is there any world in which we see Schroeder start here? I just don't think it's tenable spacing-wise to have him playing against three non-shooters in the front court. but maybe you have a different perspective on things. Where are you at with the idea of Scotty starting versus Schroeder being in there and, I guess, moving Gary Trent Jr. to the bench? Yeah, I'm with you. I think just by default, when you have a front... Well, not a front court, but when you have three guys uh, between Scotty, Pascal, and Yak, who don't offer any spacing, mm-hmm. I think those two other positions have to be shooters. And so you've got Gary, you've got OG. I think they would fit in uh, by default. And so, uh, yeah, I think that means Scotty is at the point. We've heard Darko say over and over again that Scotty is going to have the ball in his hands a lot. Uh, And so we're going to see what uh, the full point Scotty experience looks like, I think. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. We're going to get into the pros and cons of the full Scotty Point experience coming up in segments two and three. Before we do that, I do want to get your thoughts on the, the signings of Doughton, of Freeman Liberty, of just sort of, we know Schroeder is going to be a big part of the rotation. He's going to be ostensibly the sixth man. Hell, he might even compete for sixth man of the year honors because he's going to have a lot on his plate, I would think, especially organizing second units if, in fact, he does come off the bench. But uh, do you have, like, a favorite in the running to become, like, the third guard on this team? I guess, you know, fourth, I suppose, if you factor in Gary Trent Jr. Um, you know, like, third, yeah, slow Slots in behind Gary as a as a backup two guard slash can maybe handle the ball a little bit. Obviously, Malachi Flynn has been around the longest and has like pick and roll chops in theory. Hasn't really shown him all that much in the NBA. Jeff Doughton Jr., I think, really was excellent defensively last year. He brings that sort of element to his game and was not the most aggressive offensively last year when he got his shots, was obviously much better and more aggressive and sort of organizing in the G League. And then you have Javon Freeman Liberty, who is a guy who, you know, kind of become a pretty good three point shooter after not really being one in his first few years of college, finishes off his season. His last season in college is a pretty good shooter and then goes 38% last year with the Windy City Bulls um, or wherever he was playing in the G League. I think it was Windy City. Either way, um, thoughts on, you know, who might be in the sort of leader in the clubhouse for fourth guard duty on this Raptors team? Yeah, I'll go ahead with Jeff Doughton Jr. I I really like him. I, I think that, you know, when you look at his defense uh, first, uh, I think that's what stood out. Last season, I think uh, he's a, a smart player, heady player. I think obviously it's going to come down to his ability uh, to knock down shots from the outside. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, when he was in those bench units that were sort of led by Pascal, uh, I think he did a good job of, uh, you know, just getting into those uh, DHOs and just getting into Pascal and uh, finding ways to be productive, you know, in terms of cutting or being a screen setter. Um, and 
I think there were just those opportunities where, you know, he's got those catch and shoots and it's like, Hey, um, can you knock down enough of these, uh, mm -hmm. defensively? I like him a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you think of how Darko wants to play and the 0.5, uh, decision-making, I think he fits in well with that. Um, uh, Malachi is probably a bit more, you know, deliberate in terms of how he would like to operate. I think he mm -hmm. will absolutely get that opportunity. Um, you know, we saw uh, Masai kind of express that frustration in terms of uh, Malachi and Delano not maybe getting the reps that uh, he had in mind uh, under Nick Nurse. And so sure. I'm I'm sure that will factor in uh, to the season. Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at among these guys who have had like the longest stretches of success in the NBA, Malachi Flynn's the guy. I remain very unconvinced by like just like the sort of strength and ability to kind of hang with with bigger, tougher defenders as an offensive player. I think his shot making just has not been there full on, full stop. Like it's just a fact that he's not hit shots. At any level of like shooting, like he's not shooting threes, he doesn't hit twos, he doesn't score at the rim, he just does not hit shots. And that's a limiting factor. That said, there have been moments, you know, Fred Van Vliet gets hurt in the 21-22 season and Malachi gets a little bit of run and has a bit of a successful streak and then he gets hurt and it's kind of all over from there. Um, you know, we've seen little flourishes. I don't think I've seen enough to really convince me that there's something there that's really going to change tangibly change the Raptors' lives this year. But he is kind of a swing factor if he can make something work under Darko Ryakovich in his fourth season. Uh, big year for him, obviously, if he wants to kind of prolong his NBA career as well. Uh, yeah, I think Doughton probably is that guy. I, I ultimately think they're probably not going to lean on that fourth guard all that much just because I think there's more guys elsewhere on the roster that are going to be warranting minutes, and so they'll probably skew big. The, obviously, if Scotty's playing point guard, they're going to have one more forward spot available uh, to be filled in by a McDaniels or Precious Achua or Chris Boucher if he's still on the team on down the list. Um, so I'm not expecting huge things from Doughton or Freeman Liberty or Flynn, but, uh, you know, there's going to be a pretty open battle, I think, for those guys to get into the rotation, which, uh, I guess isn't a bad thing to have in camp. We'll come back on the other side, get into the Scotty of it all, as we are going to run through the pros and the cons of Scotty Barnes and the Scotty point guard experience. We'll start with the pros, try to be positive to kick things off. We'll do that in just a second here. Before we do that, however, got to tell you, better friends over at Prize Picks, who have made daily fantasy sports super fun, and you really, frankly, never got to play season long fantasy sports ever again if you're a Prize Picks player, because who needs that? Who needs to be setting your lineup every day? Who needs to be doing the thing where you're worrying about injuries and, oh my God, is this guy going to get benched for load management or whatever? No, don't worry about it. Just play prize picks. All you got to do is pick two to six players and whether they will score more or less than their prize picks projection in a given stat. And you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry if you get them all right. No competing against other people. It's just you against the projections. That is the way it should be. And of course, it's not just the NBA. In fact, it is like the NBA is a tiny little fraction of the leagues that you can go and play prize picks with. Right now, the WNBA is going strong. The Women's World Cup is on. You got F1. You got golf. Everything is in there. You can go play prize picks. No matter the sport, you can find a sport in an entry that works for you. You can make your entry in 60 seconds or less. They have safe and fast withdrawals, and they're currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada and every province except for Ontario. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That means if you put in $100, they will match that $100. What a wonderful thing. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100 with prize picks. All right, we continue on here. Vivek Jacob of Raptors.com is here, and we are talking Scotty Barnes playing the point. Uh, again, seems like this is the way the Raptors are going, whether we disagree or not. The team is putting their heads down, it seems, and going full on to the point Scotty experience this coming season, barring other moves. We'll see. But as it stands right now, that's going to be the situation. All signs are pointing towards that. So let me start off with this. What excites you the most about the idea of Scotty Barnes playing point guard, V? I think probably the biggest thing is, you know, he's on his rookie contract, which means you're trying to gather as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. And so we will learn a lot about what point Scotty looks like. I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest thing is like, hey, is this a position that is, uh, you know, viable in the long term? I, th I think mm -hmm. answering those questions uh, excites me. And then 
if there is one aspect of Scotty's game that it gets you excited about, it gets you excited about it. It's his vision, mm-hmm. and so I, I think you know his passing ability is amazing, um, and I think he's gonna get get put in a lot of scenarios where he's gonna have to make reads and he's gonna understand, uh, you know, um, manipulating defenses to get the advantages that he wants. Not you know not necessarily the initial advantage, uh, but you know the second breakdown that can happen, the third breakdown that can happen, and kind of trying to get there. Um, Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that probably excite me the most. Yeah, I think the trial by fire part of it is probably the most exciting thing because we're going to get to see a whole lot about Scotty Barnes at a time, like you mentioned, he's on his rookie deal and we're already at the point where a year from now he's going to be extension eligible. And to have the information on hand of what kind of extension you're looking at with him, this is probably the best way to get kind of a crash course in what Scotty Barnes is as a player is to kind of throw him to the wolves and see what he can do. Um, You know, we'll get into some of the drawbacks in a sec because I do think there's some stuff working against this being successful. But I I don't think you can argue that it's not like at least exciting and intriguing to watch him be tested every single night in a position that is extremely demanding. And it's going to be a big test of his conditioning. We talked about it at the end of the season. He talked about it at the end of the season, how he just wasn't there conditioning wise to kind of be Scotty Barnes for longer than those 12 minute fourth quarter stretches that had us all kind of jaw on the floor. But we have seen that, like, there's a force to the way Scotty Barnes plays, to the way he kind of can just, like, decide he's taking over a game. If you can protract that out over the course of a full game or 25 minutes or 30 minutes of action, you know, he might be able to overcome a lot of the sort of on-court spacing, you know, skill, you know, deficiencies that might exist just because of his, like, general force of will and his physicality and the fact that he can kind of just make a game into his own when he decides to do it again we have to see it for longer than short stretches like we saw last year but that's going to be exciting to see just how much he can tap into that i think like x's and o's wise like there are a lot of things that work against it but i do think there's something to the idea of just like there being a size mismatch baked into every single possession for the raptors if scotty's playing point and you have gary Trent jr as your smallest player on the floor at six foot five like that's going to force some tough matchup decisions from coaches like who's guarding Scotty where are you hiding the worst defenders or where are you hiding your point guard defender um you know are you just going to stick him on Gary Trent Jr have a wing guard Scotty do you have enough wings to guard Scotty and OG and Pascal like i think that's a pretty interesting little wrinkle do you see that being a way the raptors can kind of massage a few extra points out of a game just with Scotty kind of having size mismatches basically anytime he's on the floor yeah, I mean, it's going to come down to those. Uh, you just go into each matchup, right, and figure out where the advantage is. And so there's teams that, say, for example, theoretically, when you go into a Cavs matchup, yeah, yeah. Garland and Mitchell are small guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how are Cleveland going to work against that? Are they just going to have Mobley out there on the perimeter? Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, stick- if so, have a day, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, uh, Things like that are going to be interesting to observe. Um, I think, you know, someone like Donovan Mitchell, I thought really showed uh, his ability to pick passes last season. Mm -hmm. And I thought um, he had studied teams playbooks pretty well in that and like really created a lot of like leak out opportunities. Um, And so I don't think they'll kind of have him on ball. I, th- I think they'll probably lean towards, again, just uh, his ability to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think individual matchups like that, because, again, as a whole, the league is getting bigger, right? True. So yeah, uh, how many teams do you genuinely have that advantage against? Uh, that's another thing that you have to look at as well. So uh, I, I look at that as more of, like, you know, a team matchup base. Um, mm-hmm. Like, look at the Milwaukee Bucks there's not going to be a huge advantage there, right? Drew Holiday <laughs> guarding Scotty Barnes kind of sounds uh, like a bloodbath, but... Uh... <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I think stuff like that, you know, you, you look at uh, the Knicks, for example. Yeah, sure, Brunson is um, a smaller guy that Scotty should be able to take advantage of, but Brunson's also really, you know, tough as nails, and mm-hmm. he's got some real strength to him. And so 
I think all of that comes down to, you know, what the matchup is at the end of the day. And so, again, with the league getting bigger, it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see, you know, how often that advantage genuinely exists. Yeah, for sure. The other part of this is the defense. And I, I don't quite know where I come down on this because the results so far for Scotty as like a point of attack defender have not been good. He is a little overzealous. He doesn't seem to like realize he has a 7-3 wingspan and kind of gets too fu- too up close on guys, allows blowbys, and kind of gets out of position just with his overzealousness. That said, I am still very high on Scotty's upside as a defender because of the length and because like he's just a smart basketball player. Like again, his reads on offense are excellent. He really seems to understand the way the game works. And I think that typically lends itself well to being a good defender. And I wonder if backstopped by, you know, Pascal as like a help rim protector and Yak as your go-to, you know, at the at the rim sort of last line of defense and OG on the wing digging down and, you know, Gary's ability to kind of, you know, hawk passing lanes. I wonder if there's enough of like a cushion behind Scotty where he feels at liberty to kind of, you know, either sort of ratchet up the intensity and kind of funnel guys where they need to go on the defense, or does he even feel more at liberty to just kind of hang back and be more of a sort of laid back defender who just kind of lets defenders come to him and his enormous length? He's going to have size advantages most of the time, you'd think, as a defender. Can he corral those smaller, you know, more more quick point guards? That remains to be seen. That's a thing the Raptors struggle with anyway last year. So maybe trying something new with Scotty being the point of attack guy isn't the worst thing in the world. But And you have OG as sort of like a bailout guy if you need him to swap onto a, an assignment. You know, we know he can guard the Trey Youngs and the Donovan Mitchells of the world that maybe Scotty's going to struggle with. Um, I, I'm still bullish on Scotty as a defender overall will it very like will it play out very well as a point guard this season defensively I'm not sure what are your thoughts on that because I remain very bullish on this defense as much as I'm very skeptical skeptical of the offense I think the defense has a chance to be excellent the guard rotation we talked about you know Schroeder Doughton you know Barnes in theory like there's a lot of defensive upside there where are you at with with Scotty as a point of attack defender and, and can that be a sort of an area of strength for this team in theory if Scotty is the full-time point guard yeah, I think the biggest thing for Scotty here will probably be the clarity of role. Mm-hmm. I think if you were to look at the entire sample of his NBA career defensively so far, you would say his best defensive minutes have come at center. Yeah, um, unfortunately, sure. that is not going to be the case anymore. You've got Jakob Berto, mm-hmm. you've got Christian Coloco. Um, he is going to see sparing minutes at center, I will say. Um, I, sh- I will say before you, t- sorry to interrupt. He should be playing at center in second units a lot with Dennis Schroeder and shooters. That like I think that's a thing that should be happening. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think you know, consistent going into the season, knowing that you're going to be consistently defending the perimeter, mm-hmm. I think that lends towards him kind of over the summer saying, "Hey, okay, this is what I need to be ready for. This is what I need to prep for," and then coming in and being able to do that. Um, We've obviously seen the blowbys. That's probably the biggest thing that he needs to um, correct uh, mm-hmm. and learn from. Uh, I, th- I think um, he's got to use his size to his advantage. He doesn't need to, uh, you know, the extent to which he gets up on guys on the perimeter is probably, you know, a bit too intense. And I think he can back off a little bit. Um, I think he gets a little too vertical as well, uh, mm-hmm. which. Uh, puts him in a bind and he's kind of always trailing after that Uh, and so that's probably the biggest thing that I want to see improve Um, and again just getting the reps at it that is kind of the positive right and Mm -hmm. like okay this is something you're just gonna have to learn and take your lumps along the way Um, besides that like we know what's gonna happen with with the transition play he's gonna be excellent Um, you know when he's bring down uh, bring the ball down the court and someone's uh you know beating their man down the floor he's really good at those hit aheads uh, yeah. i think that's something that that's going to be uh there for him and some of the other stuff is going to come down to how much his ball handling has improved right that's mm-hmm. a, that's another area uh that's going to be important for him uh, i know we start, this was mainly about his defense um <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i think in terms of the pros of scotty a lot of it is just about you know getting reps and um, you know, his consistency and his willingness to score 
because mm-hmm. I think we've seen the games where he comes out and he's like, I'm going to score early. It kind of takes that pressure off him. Uh, mm-hmm. It takes uh, it takes defenders away, you know, from what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And that's basically, you know, hey, we know Scotty wants to pass. Like, let's take that away. But now when he's scoring, it's like, okay, well, now it's a problem. We got to focus on that. Now all the passing lanes are open. All, all the options that he wants to consider are open. And that's what makes him uh, his best. And so mm-hmm. I think that willingness to score um, and that balance between playmaking and scoring is going to be the biggest thing for him this season. 100%. Uh, we'll get into the the downsides of the idea of Scotty running point in a sec. Before we do that, just quick thought on the defense just to kind of cap things off here i I do think the reason i'm bullish is that the tools are obviously there for him to corral smaller guys to stay in front of guys like they're there i think a lot of his mistakes over his first couple years have been errors of commission just like trying too hard which i'd rather see than just like someone not trying at all and it kind of gives me hope that you kind of channel that energy a little bit more and you'll get better results just because of the sheer fact that you're six foot nine and enormous and are going to kind of blanket smaller guards if you can kind of find that in between balance a little bit more. Um, we'll come back on the other side, get into the cons of the idea of Scotty playing point guard. And look, I think there are a lot of them. Uh, we're going to get into that in just a second. Before we do, however, just a reminder, go check out Locked on Leafs, our daily Toronto Maple Leafs podcast. They're down to three a week in the offseason right now, but Mike and Dave do a wonderful job breaking down all of the rumors swirling around William Nylander, Austin Matthews extensions, all that stuff. Very big stuff going on with the, with the Maple Leafs right now. Go check out Locked on Leafs every day. Eric Carlson, anyone? Go listen to Mike and Dave. We'll hear what they think about that possibility as well wherever you get your podcasts and on youtube all right the cons of point scotty look i feel kind of like a wet blanket all the time when talking about scotty barnes because i think i just kind of come at it with a little bit more realism than a lot of people do in that i i'm tend to be a little more skeptical of like high-end upside ever being reached by players i think it we we build up guys in our heads and they don't quite get there and so i admit i'm coming at this from a bit more of a skeptical lens when it comes to why i'm not super in on scotty at point guard as a full-time thing do i think they should be doing it in stretches absolutely i do i think you have to get the proof of concept and see what he can do as a lead guard lead ball handler whatever you want to call it uh this coming season we talked about the extension stuff that's all important stuff you have to see it but as like a full-time 35 minute a night he's the point guard type of thing i think there are some ways this could go really really wrong big v Uh, let me ask you first what is your biggest hang up your biggest area of concern when it comes to full-time point Scotty, is that well, what comes to mind is like, ooh, that could be the thing that causes the downfall here. So, I mean, the biggest con is really nothing to do with Scotty. Mm. The biggest con is the fact that this is a poorly designed roster <laughs> for Scotty to play point guard. Yes. You, you need way more shooting. Uh, and, you know, you could say the same about Pascal as well, right? As, mm-hmm. as much as his playmaking has improved the last few seasons, it has a definitive ceiling because of the roster construction. Mm-hmm. And so I think the biggest con has, it doesn't really have much to do with Scotty. It has to do with the fact that there's a f- roster that really can't shoot the ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that puts a definitive ceiling on how good he can be on the role. Uh, uh, in the role. And so, uh, you know, as a general with Scotty, like I'm, I'm fine with kind of exploring the depths of his point guard ability. And Mm -hmm. so I think going into the season, it's more about just like, what are the questions I'm looking for answers to? Uh, And so I don't individually, I don't see like major cons. Mm hmm. I disagree there a little because I think there is one big thing that is just not present in his game, has not been present in his game, and is present in the game of just about every effective lead ball handler in the NBA in 2023. 
It's pull-up shooting. I know I keep hammering this in the absence of Fred Van Vliet, but I'm sorry, it's just the way basketball is played in 2023. And if you want to run an effective pick-and-roll offense, which it sounds as though that's what Darko Ryakovic intends to do. The man has written dissertations on pick-and-roll basketball, and the way you run a 0.5 offense is to start with an initial advantage created probably with a high pick-and-roll. That's just how this operates. And I don't see how there are going to be those consistent advantages created at the start of possessions without any form of pull-up shooting in Scotty Barnes's game. Maybe he walks into the season next year and is an incredible pull-up shooter. Guys make leaps all the time. It's a pretty substantial leap to ask him to go and walk into this season as the lead guard and have like a, a you know a, an uptick in volume and accuracy from three-point range. It's unrealistic, frankly, to ask that of him. Just some numbers for you. Last season... On pull-up twos, he was a 35.3% shooter on 2.2 attempts a game. Very low volume and not exactly nailing it from those mid-range areas. He, he fell off as a mid-range shooter in every you know section of the floor from his rookie season into year number two. Team context obviously matters there. It was a weird team last year. There was clunk. There was lack of space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he didn't have a pull-up game to speak of last year. On threes last year, 21.4% on 0.7 attempts a game. That's just not good enough if you are a lead ball handler on an offense. Think of all the lead guards on all the good teams. Jamal Murray, Donovan Mitchell, Steph Curry, Luka Doncic, Damian Lillard, James Harden, Trey Young, Zach Levine. Playoff Jimmy Butler is playoff Jimmy Butler because he starts pulling up from three like a maniac in the playoffs. You have De'Aaron Fox, Chris Middleton, Tyrese Maxey on down the line. Hell, Kyle Lowry's entire career took off when he figured out, oh, I can be a pull-up shooting threat. That is the thing that turned Kyle Lowry from previous Kyle Lowry into the greatest Raptor of all time. Pull-up shooting matters. I'm sorry. It just does. And Scotty Barnes doesn't have it right now. And I don't know how you can go in and think, okay, we're going to create good advantages with a guy who teams are not going to have to think about guarding. What is offense about? It's about making defenses make decisions and having to complicate the way they want to do things by making them concede things they don't want to concede. What are you conceding if Scotty Barnes is running a pick and roll, Jakob Pertl comes up to set the screen, the defender is going to go under the screen because Scotty can't burn them there. He's not going to be able to walk in and step into mid-range jumpers. Like He just doesn't have that in his repertoire right now. If he does, great. That's incredible, but he hasn't shown that on a consistent basis. He doesn't have a pull-up three to spread the defense, pull the defense further out, open up passing lanes and cutting lanes and channels on the backside of the pick and roll. It's just not there, and I, I, you can't just invent that. You can't just be like, well, he's gonna maybe he'll figure it out. I hope he does, because if he doesn't, this is going to be like the easiest offense in the NBA to guard. It's going to be incredibly easy to switch against the Raptors. It's going to be incredibly easy to go under screens and pack the paint, have your big man wait near the rim. And yes, Scotty Barnes is good at chewing up space, getting to the rim and scoring over bigger guys. I don't think that can be the crux of your offense. And his passing is not going to get the same advantage that you would get with him working in the middle of the floor against a four on three, for example, because there's going to be fewer passing lanes. Teams are going to be able to stick on shooters. It's just going to be very cramped and clunky. And I don't see how you get over this very real hurdle in modern NBA basketball. You have to have a pull-up shooting threat at the start of your offense for your team to be successful on offense, and they don't have that right now. Am I being too much of an alarmist about this lack of this skill? Am I being too down on the idea that it could develop? Like, I just don't see it. 21.4% on pull-ups. All of the guys I just lifted, lift, listed off, the very low end of pull-up shooting from a lot of these guys is like 30% on five attempts a game. That's just, Scotty's nowhere in that ballpark right now. I feel like I'm going insane because there's just no way this offense is going to be good if Scotty Barnes is the full-time point guard without a pull-up three, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we know that's a weakness in his game. But mm -hmm. again, like when I talk about, when I say I don't have an issue with like, going ahead with this mm -hmm. this was a half court out offense that finished 29th last year that's true it stunk last year too so what You're damn right 30th <laughs> Boo -hoo. Yeah. like um go ahead and see what it's like and get your answers and we'll see if the mid-range has improved i'm not expecting anything from three mm -hmm. um you know if that's the, if, if those are the arguments like 
Pascal's pull-up numbers aren't great either. No, they're not. So, they, they, it's almost so, as though they should so have some guards on the team. Say, don't put the ball in his hands either. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So I think from that standpoint, uh, you know, again, we know those are the weaknesses in his game. So again, for me, coming into a player's third season, it's it's still more about me like, hey, these are the questions. How do you answer them? I'm not going to go and be like, well, this is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea if you're expecting to win 50 games, 60 games. Sure. Sure. If if the Raptors win 35 games next year, I'm not going to be stunned. No, neither will I. Yeah. So, so that's where, again, it's, it's based on expectations, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, all those players you listed, uh, they're on winning teams. Um, They're trying to do big things. Um, and I don't think the Raptors are trying to do that this year. Mm-hmm. And so I think from that standpoint, from in terms of the team expectations that I have, I'm like, yeah, go ahead, see what Scotty can do, max it out, and then you can evaluate from there. Do yeah, I that's think, totally fair. Yeah. Do I think, you know, that's going to be like the mid range and, you know, all that pull up stuff is going to one day become like the bread and butter of his game? Not really. No. Mm hmm. But Mm -hmm. let's see where it can get to and let's kind of push him in that direction. And that's fine. And and that's all I'm looking to see. Um, You know, if I were to look at, again, and even this is more of like a question, right? Putting Scotty at the point, you anticipate that it will take away somewhat from a couple of big strengths of his game, which are the offensive rebounding, Mm -hmm. um, his cutting off the ball, and you know where he's able to create those passing angles for pascal and yak and you know sometimes you know he goes up strong and finishes it himself and sometimes it's uh, a, d- a dump off pass for someone else to finish and mm-hmm. so for me i can say like yeah it's going to be taken away to a certain extent and that's a con but i'm also just like hey how much does that get taken away you know cuz pascal is mm-hmm. still going to have the ball in his hands a ton as long as he's on this team (laughs) for sure yeah it's uh look am i like putting a like a cap on scotty's pull up game it's fine we're we're reversing roles today i'm yeah everything is fine guy and you're (laughs) (laughs) i i guess it's just sort of like the team keeps on talking about we're gonna win we're gonna try to win we're not gonna rebuild which i agree with but like if you're going to do it, build a roster in which it can make sense. And I just don't think that exists right now for them. We to are in full win. agreement there. The roster yeah. does not make sense at all. No, it's like totally, it, there's too many forwards, man. Like it's, you, you've reached the point of diminishing returns on large dudes. Uh, and, and it's tough. And, and I think, you know, I, you landed on something else really, really good, which is the idea of him just kind of being taken away from spots on the floor where he's already succeeded. We've seen him be a tremendous short roller and like working from the nail, options all around, going to score versus passing, kicking out, hitting cutters. Like he's incredible there. He can be a dribble handoff guy. Like he, he's got a lot to his game that is not point guard stuff. And I, I fear that you sort of funnel him too far down this point guard road and maybe that stuff starts to atrophy a little bit. I don't know. Like well, there, there will be chances to get him those those looks in those spots, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be as frequent, especially with Yaka Pirtle on the floor now. And look, I get it. He thinks he's a point guard. He's been a point guard his entire life. The team seems to fancy him a point guard. But we also like want things all the time that we're not like, I wish I was Zach Lowe. I'm not, I'm worse than Zach Lowe at doing this thing. So I adapted and this is my life now. Uh, Like you have to accept your limitations and I am concerned about those limitations and I'm concerned about funneling him away from the stuff that we've already seen. He can do at an incredibly high level and having his development kind of sapped because of that in this interest of this sort of utopia of Scotty Barnes as point guard. Everything is beautiful. Odds are, like, it's just without a better fitting roster and without some serious steps forward in a couple of key areas, I think it's going to be a challenge for Scotty to make all this work. Look, am I excited to watch it? Absolutely. Am I going into this season with low expectations, which is the best thing you can possibly go into a season with? Absolutely. Am I open to being proven wrong? 100%. I'm wrong all the goddamn time. Uh, But, like, it, it, it just, to me, looking at 
how basketball works in the modern modern age and the limitations of the roster around Scotty and Scotty's own limitations. I am very dubious that this point Scotty thing is going to work out very well. And if they're pivoting towards this in lieu of keeping Pascal Siakam around and having it kind of be his team and all this stuff, I just kind of think that's a maybe a bit, bit of a misguided way to go. But that's, we'll leave it there for now. I don't want to be too much of a bummer on a Monday because, again, there's a lot to like here. There's a lot to be excited about. Scotty Barnes running point and transition and the Magic Johnson comparisons will surely be brought up at some point this year, and that's very exciting. But uh, I think hold your horses if you're getting too high on the Scotty point guard is going to be the thing that leads the Raptors to the promised land thing, I suppose, is just where I'm at. Temper the expectations. I love Big the energy. V, I love the thank energy. you for being the it's fine guy today because I feel like I'm <laughs> losing my mind a little bit uh anything you want to promote for it's the good fine people if your expectations are low 100 <laughs> percent. just have that be fine if that should be what it's applied when you months. go into eating a meal when you go into using twitter when you go into listening to this podcast when you go into a basketball season have low expectations and you'll never be disappointed uh big v where can people check out all your work <clears throat> um usual spot raptors.com uh besides that you can follow me on uh, i believe it's called x now uh, formerly twitter <laughs> at the vec m jacob uh yeah we'll see where things go with that but uh yeah <laughs> we know that site's never going away it's just going to get increasingly worse while all of us sickos are like follow us there because it's the place to follow us i know i'm, I'm gonna go down with the ship i'm glad all of you will too um Everyone, uh, thanks so much for tuning in, of course. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. Unsure what the topic of tomorrow's show will be. I want to get a little more uh, positive and optimistic, I think. So I'll, I'll try to work on something for tomorrow to be less of a big wet blanket man. Uh, <laughs> we will do that. We'll, of course, have Katie Heindel back this week. Jamar Hines will be back this week. we got some good guests booking up for the next uh, couple weeks as well. And... Guess what? Ranking every Raptors back this week because the summertime is here and I have much less going on and so I can take the time to edit together these extremely tedious videos. Uh, we'll have Ranking Every Raptor another installment at some point this week, so keep an eye out there. And uh, we'll, we'll have all of the players counted down in Ranking Every Raptor before the season begins. You have the scout's honor on that one. You have my, my full promise there. So with that... We will leave you. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We'll be back again Tuesday. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for hanging as always. Bye-bye.